support. We play a crucial role in the climate issue. I think we cannot ignore this. The ambition of our unified port is to be the first port to reconcile people, climate and economy. We want to give every chance to hydrogen as an energy carrier and therefore commit ourselves as an active pioneer of the hydrogen economy. The combination of Antwerp's position as the second largest integrated petrochemical cluster in the world and the coastal position of Zeebrugge provides, I think, a unique opportunity to take a leading role in the rollout of the hydrogen economy in Western Europe. Together with our expertise in receiving, storing, transforming and transmitting energy, this makes us a crucial player in the hydrogen strategy. Together with our partners, we are investing in infrastructure to accelerate the import, the transport and the production of green hydrogen. We will indeed produce locally a bit of green hydrogen in both platforms. The presence of wind farms and natural gas infrastructure make Zeebrugge the ideal location to build a plant to produce green hydrogen. Fluxis and Eoli joined forces recently for the construction of this plant, which will be operational from 2023. And the American stock-listed company Plug announced recently the investment of a 100 megawatt plant in Europe at the circular hotspot next-gen district. But Belgium is, of course, too small to produce the required quantities of green hydrogen on its own. We will need, therefore, to import green hydrogen and hydrogen carriers from regions that have sufficient sun and wind, as well as space, in abundance. By 2028, the port of Antwerp aims to have the capacity to receive the first green molecules on the platform. To join forces, the port has formed the hydrogen import coalition with five major industrial public players and stakeholders. All of them are here today, DEME, NG, Exma, Fluxis and Waterstoff. In order to import and transport hydrogen and hydrogen carriers, infrastructure such as hydrogen backbones and terminals is key. Therefore, the port is working to expand terminal capacity for existing and new hydrogen carriers at both port sites. Besides this, we are also using hydrogen to green our own fleet. The Hydro Tuck, the result of a great partnership with uh, CMB and ABC, both here today, will be the world's first hydrogen-powered tugboat. And I can already invite all of you, beginning of next year, when we will organize the name-giving event here in the port. These projects to import, produce, and transport green hydrogen make the port an essential player in the ambition to make Belgium a European import hub of green hydrogen. But we can only do this if we are all on the same page. Ports, governments and companies. Partnerships and cooperation between all stakeholders are key. And so is the right support from the government in order to have a level playing field, a workable regulatory framework and grounds to kickstart the green economy on hydrogen. A clear strategy is important to have a transparent framework and level of ambition. And I look forward to a revised hydrogen strategy that provides concrete direction, recognizes the import as a pillar of our energy and feedstock supply, and demonstrates our commitment to working with industry to develop solutions to potential challenges that may still lie in our path, like, for instance, certification. I'm very glad to have you all here today and I'm very happy to give the floor to our Prime Minister for his hydrogen strategy. We are all ears. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, Mr. van der Meer and Jacques, thank you very much for uh, hosting us in this, in this very humble building that you have here in Antwerp. It's, it's all in the spirit of Antwerp being humble and not too much striking and having something that does not attract the eye. It's always a pleasure to be, uh, to be here. Also would like uh, to thank the, the Boston Consulting Group for assisting us in developing this revised um, hydrogen uh, strategy. Um, happy, of course, to see very large delegations of the industry here and also a very large delegation of um, uh, ambassadors and other international relations, which we have in, uh, in Belgium. Very happy to, um, uh, to have you here. This hydrogen strategy, you might think it's about energy, and it is about energy, but to me, it is as much about energy as it is about industry. And that's, that, for me, is the key element. We are having a lot of energy discussions these days. That is... Uh, due to many, uh, many circumstances, due to the energy crisis and the security crisis in which we are in Europe uh, today. But the fundamental discussion is also about what do we do to keep heavy industry here on the European continent. And that might be at risk. If we do not intervene on the short term, we might be faced with a, a disindustrialization uh, move towards other parts of the world, and that would be not a good thing for the prosperity that we have in Europe. We under, are under tremendous pressure because of the circumstances, but also on trying to maintain industrial activity here in, uh, in Europe. And actually, if you look at the combination of heavy industry and especially chemistry here in, uh, in, in, in Antwerp and other parts of the world, there are not that many countries in Europe that know how this works. And this is especially uh, the case related to chemistry. Uh, chemistry is something which is hugely concentrated here in Antwerp. We have the second, second biggest cluster in the world after, uh, after Houston. There's maybe between five and ten European countries that know actually how chemistry works. And so let me say that the, uh, the, 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 the group of countries that defend this core industry, there's actually not that many countries that defend it well. And I think Belgium actually has the expertise and, and the knowledge to defend it, uh, to defend it well. Um, some might remember that approximately two months ago, um, I, I made a statement that maybe shocked a few people. I said two months ago that we might be heading for five difficult winters. And um, that surprised some people uh, because in general I'm someone who's rather optimistic. And so I got a lot of questions on why did you say that? Well, first of all, I said it because I believe it's true. Um, that's maybe a basic rule. Today, I do not see that many elements, and we're two months later, I don't see that many elements that falsify what I said two months, uh, two months ago. I think we are going for five difficult years. Why did I say it loudly? Is because I think that it is important to realize the situation in which we are. If you realize it well, then of course you can take action. And that is the real reason why I said that, is that yes, we might be heading for five difficult years, but if we do it well, we can take a gigantic step forward, which is probably worth 20 years in innovation, in bringing people together, in developing the right strategy. And something like this, the hydrogen strategy, for me is a moment like, uh, like this. If we do this well, if we use this moment, which is a turbulent moment, we can take a gigantic step forward. And that really, for me, is the core of what we should be discussing today. I would like to address two topics which I think are, uh, are important. First one is the value of industrial policy, and a second one is what do we need at the European level to better integrate our energy policies. Maybe first on the value of industrial policy. Um, I could remember that 10 years ago there was some doubt on do actually governments still have a role to play in this? Shouldn't we just leave it to the free market and leave it to the industry and probably good things will come out of it? I'm still a believer in the free market, of course, and, and though I have made some statements on the functioning of the gas market, for example, I still believe that the free market is the most efficient way to organize um, allocation of, uh, of resources. But collaboration of industry and governments in, in setting industrial policy, I think it is more important than ever. And if you just look in, in energy, just look at the choices we made in the past, and the position in which it puts us today. If we are an energy hub today, as Mr. van der Meeren said, 
It's also because we made some choices 20, 30 years ago to become an LNG hub in Zeebrugge. That was a deliberate industrial policy to do it. And are we happy to have it today? Are we happy to have that hub to not be in a situation where we would be thinking about, about scarcity of supply, but we are rather in a situation where we're helping other countries to stay on their, uh, on their feet? You could say the same about the choice we made in the 70s about nuclear energy. These were deliberate choices that at that moment were important and attracted such an amount of industrial, uh, industrial um, activity. The same could be said about offshore wind. Offshore wind was a deliberate choice that we made in, uh, in, in Belgium, and we've now grown way beyond the borders of what we can do in our own country. If there was the summit in Eschberg um, a month ago with the core countries in producing offshore wind, that the Netherlands and Denmark were there and Germany was there, it's logical that Belgium is there. Well, looking at our coastline, people could think, well, how come you are there? Well, we're there because we're good, obviously, and we are now exporting the expertise to the rest of the world. I believe that related to hydrogen, we're in the same situation. This is a choice to be made, and this is a choice to be made supported with investment. And on investment, uh, we've made quite some commitment to this space. If you look at the investment that have been made uh, related to the RRF, the RRF is the, is the European Investment Fund, it's almost 450 million of, of, of public spending that we have committed to, uh, to hydrogen, really showing how important this is uh, for us. And of course, it fits in a strategy. And the strategy is to build on the energy hub that we have, related to hydrogen and all the other pipelines, to really triple that infrastructure. An infrastructure that, of course, will still do natural gas, but will also do hydrogen and also do CO2. That is based on the hub position we have and on the location we have, and, of course, is being complemented by the industry that we have here. You have here a gigantic cluster of off-takers of all types of, um, of, of, uh, of energy, and that in the the hydrogen strategy that we are making, that is for us the core. I know that some people are saying that on hydrogen the jury is still out, and I agree. I think that in some domains the jury is still out. But on feedstock for industry, that is quite clear. Everyone knows that it is something that we need, and I'm convinced that without hydrogen, it is going to be extremely difficult to keep industrial policy, industrial activity here in Europe but also to be climate uh, neutral. Bringing these two things uh, together is a deliberate choice from the different Belgian uh, governments, and that's the reason why we have made this strategy together with, uh, with you. Second topic I wanted to address is on how we manage things on the European continent. And energy policy has been at the core of the discussion over the past, uh, over the past months. And I'm convinced that this is the moment where we need to take a gigantic step forward, and we've done that in the past. If you look at the European construction, where did it come from? It emerged after the Second, War, the Second World War, but what were the domains we first worked on? Well, it was the European community of coal and steel. It was Euratom related to nuclear energy. It came out of energy and out of in industry, and then it evolved in so many, in so many other things. Again, I think we are at a moment like this where we have to bring energy policy again at European, uh, European integration because of the industrial and economic value that it has that I already explained, but also because it is at the core also a security topic. Today, stabilizing the European continent is related to stabilizing our energy supply. And stabilizing our energy supply means looking at what we can produce ourselves, and we have potential in renewable, but we will continue importing and probably also exporting energy with the rest of the world. I hear some people saying this crisis means uh, that we would put globalization in reverse. I completely disagree with that. Um, I think that's wrong. I think for a country like Belgium, it would also be an extremely bad idea. Globalization has brought an incredible amount of, uh, of prosperity to Europe, but also to the rest of the world. And we Europeans, we are second to none. I mean, we are the biggest trader to the rest of the, um, of, of the world. 
What will change is that in our relation to the rest of the world, we have to be more diversified. We cannot be in a situation where we would again be so dependent on certain countries, for example, related to energy. But the same applies to being too dependent related to security and being too uh, related to some countries related to certain technologies. Diversifying, for me, is the core of maintaining the stability on the European, on the European continent. And that means that related to energy, we need to get this element of each on their own, we need to get away from this. And, and, and we have a long way to go, because if you look at European discussions today, you again have a risk that certain countries say, well, you know, energy supply is really about our sovereignty, and we should solve it ourselves. We could not be more wrong. If we want to stabilize us as European continent, grouping our energy policy and having common goals and deciding on how we collaborate with each other in doing that is the way forward. We as Belgians, we do this. If you look at the situation today, with our gas supply, we are keeping certain big countries on their feet. And with our electricity supply, we are keeping certain other big countries on their feet. And, and Mr. Ambassador, I think at some point in London there was almost a blackout and the Belgian supply helped it. I'm not saying this to say, hey, look at how great we are. I'm saying this to tell you that integration of our policies and integration of our networks is the way how we will stabilize our, uh, ourselves. And the hydrogen strategy, to me, is something that we make on the national level, but I hope that other countries will, um, will complement on this. And we know that uh, Germany already has a hydrogen strategy, which is actually quite similar to what we are developing, uh, uh, developing here. So this hydrogen strategy, for me, takes the two boxes that I, that I talked about. Industrial policy and developing it together with the industry and developing it together with you. Um, European policy, which in the core should be something where we integrate but where we reach out to the rest of the world. That is the message to me. We Europeans, we will remain open to the rest of the world. We are open for partnerships. We are open for sharing uh, technology. I think that more than ever we are convinced that if we have strong international relationships, which are more diversified than what we used to have, this is the best way of creating prosperity for us Europeans, but also for the rest of the, uh, of the world. So I'm looking forward to uh, the debates that we will have uh, here. We will have uh, two debates moderated by um, two of the finest people of my government, our Minister of Energy, who has quite a heavy agenda, and also our State Secretary, Thomas Dermin, State Secretary for, um, for Scientific Policy. I would like to thank both of them in collaborating in, uh, in developing this hydrogen uh, strategy. And then, in the end, a strategy is good. I mean, it can have a nice event like this. We can have some nice discussions. Strategy, of course, only is worth something if we do something with it and if we implement it. And that's the key thing. Uh, success is 10% strategy, it's 90% implementation. For implementation, I count on you on developing all the good things we have in Belgium and to show it to the rest of the world. Thank you and good luck with that. Thank you, Prime Minister, for outlining the energy vision of Belgium and making an opening for the first of our two panel discussions. We will now have uh, the first uh, panel discussion. The first one will be on infrastructure and regulation and led by Tine van der Straaten, the Belgian Minister of Energy. Please join me on stage, Tine van der Straaten, Minister of Energy, Daria Nojevnik, Director of the Hydrogen Council, Pascal De Buc, Managing Director and CEO of Fluxus, Wouter Bleuks, Business Manager Hydrogen and Innovin, and Christophe Brognon, Senior Partner and Managing Director of the Boston Consulting Group. Good morning to uh, all of you. Uh, 
From my side, also thank you, Jacques, uh, for hosting us uh, here today, and thank you also for the inspiring words, uh, Alexander de Croo. He thanked us, but we should thank him uh, because uh, he is, uh, as a prime minister, uh, guiding us and uh, making us work hard, uh, but also uh, keeping us uh, up to date. Because, as the prime minister said, uh, hydrogen is a deliberate policy option. It's not just something that is fancy. It's not uh, just uh, the next uh, bubble. It's a deliberate uh, policy option and deliberate uh, policy uh, choice. Why? Uh, it will be the catalyst uh, for further economic welfare. It's an industrial uh, vision, and it's also an energy uh, security uh, vision. This panel will be used to take a deep dive, a little bit of a deep dive uh, into uh, infrastructure. Today, uh, in this uh, huge uh, uh, energy crisis, we see that we rely on infrastructure uh, to safeguard not only ourselves in Belgium, but also our neighboring countries uh, like Germany and other landlocked uh, countries. And that's why we have worked uh, the last uh, months on an update of our uh, hydrogen uh, vision with regard to uh, this infrastructure and also the import uh, strategy. And I would uh, first uh, uh, like to uh, introduce uh, Christophe Brognon, uh, the senior partner of BCG, and to ask you to, to, to give a little um, insight on the different uh, import um, um, routes that we saw and what we specifically updated uh, in our uh, hydrogen uh, vision. Thank you, Minister. Uh, so if you, you think of uh, routes, first we need to make a distinction between um, uh, green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. Um, I think the target is clearly green hydrogen, but we need to get fast in this market and be very pragmatic uh, in the interest of speed, because there is a competition there, and it's a competition also between European countries. I agree with our Prime Minister that we should play it as a European team, but the reality is that the industry in Belgium is in competition with industry in neighboring countries. And uh, the speed at which we are able to uh, uh, develop uh, access to decarbonation lever for our industry will have a role in the competitiveness of our industry. And blue, as the advantage of being rapid uh, to, to, to bring in some places. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect is that there is hydrogen, pure hydrogen, that would, be, uh, that would arrive, most probably build, uh, manufactured very closely uh, to, to Belgium or in Belgium, so we could have uh, uh, hydrolyzers in Belgium, um, or piped. We can imagine a northern route uh, coming from, uh, from Norway, we could imagine a southern route uh, pipe, from pipe uh, so, so from, from Algeria, southern Europe, and, and also an eastern uh, route. I mean, on the short term, probably uh, it's a bit more complex, but uh, over the long term, we, we, we never know. Um, the, the other aspect we need to, to have in mind is that there will be derivatives. Uh, some of the demand, uh, maybe not for hydrogen. Uh, pure uh, decarbonated hydrogen but for derivatives, let's say ammonia, uh, for example. Um, and notably for heavy industry, it can be pretty interesting. The advantage, advantage is that we can ship it from much further away, uh, where in places where there is a, a huge renewable resource and, and you can have uh, huge quantities of uh, green uh, derivatives uh, built uh, through, uh, from manufactured through, through hydrogen locally. Um, if we want to, to win on the two uh, sides, um, I think the ma managing that demand uh, is evolving for both will be important. And in our view, one point which is pretty important is that when there is potential demand which is close to the ports, we orient it towards derivatives rather than pure hydrogen to be able to have the two infrastructures be developed in parallel. Thank you, uh, Christophe, as you've said, uh, and that's also reflected in our hydrogen, uh, new hydrogen uh, strategy, uh, to be as independent as possible, also to anchor our industries. We have a focus on different sources, 
you mentioned blue and green, but also the derivatives, but also roots, divers diversification in roots is important. And that's why we have now clearly indicated in our vision uh, that we have the North Sea route, the Southern route, and also the shipping route. All of three of them will work together and will assure us um, with uh, this independence, uh, but also uh, security of supply. And then uh, Pascal uh, de Buc, I want to come to you. Pascal de Buc, CEO of Fluxis, we now rely uh, on, um, on your if I may say your, but in the royal, in the royal you, on your network yeah, with the LNG uh, terminal, also with the pipeline infrastructure, which is helping uh, our neighboring uh, countries. Uh, it's our absolute, inten our absolute intention to do the same with regard to hydrogen, with the ports that we have in Belgium, our industries uh, located also uh, in Belgium, and to, um, to be as Belgium at an energy crossroads, as Jacques uh, said, and to stay uh, the same. So uh, my question to you would be how will Flux uh, build on his past experiences and to bring uh, the future uh, into reality, not just an ambition on, on a plan, but how to implement and to make sure that we have this um, infrastructure that at the one hand will make us more independent and at the other hand uh, will mean solidarity also with different countries um, and important to our industries. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, uh, thank you, Jacques, uh, for this event. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, indeed, so um, Fluxus as an infrastructure company uh, has already started uh, uh, with uh, uh, this, this new uh, value chain. Uh, uh, and basically, we started uh, with uh, talking with the Belgium industry. <coughs> and Belgium is, of course, as the Prime Minister was saying, <coughs> Sorry, a very uh, interesting position uh, to kickstart uh, this new uh, energy chain uh, since we are very uh, industry intensive and we have industrial clusters. Uh, we have also ports. Uh, we have an industrial, uh, we have an, a good infrastructure existing. So if you combine all this, uh, we can quick start uh, very quickly, kickstart very quickly on the condition, of course, that we have clients and that we have supply. Uh, that is quite important. Our role is, of course, to supply uh, uh, the industry with infrastructure solutions, which are there before uh, uh, the, the, inf the, the uh, market is really uh, developed as such, or just in time. So we started in uh, contacting the whole industry and see where we are in terms of uh, new projects uh, in terms of consumption uh, in order to be ready in the industrial clusters in time with the first infrastructure pipelines. Also with the infrastructure import facilities. Uh, so we started to doing uh, uh, feasibility studies uh, in order to have the infrastructure ready for importing as we did in the past with LNG. Diversification will be very important. And the Prime Minister said it, diversification is key in that respect. So we should table on the different routes, we should table on different um, uh, forms of import of this hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives. So in that respect, pipelines is one uh, thing, so we will build them. And second thing is infrastructure in terms of receiving terminals. We will have uh, the ambition, we have the ambition and the targets uh, to uh, have already capacity to transport uh, hydrogen by 2030 equivalent to uh, 30 terawatt hour. So that's quite a significant target that we put ourselves. Uh, so the ambition is to have the first infrastructure in place by 26 uh, and to have this capacity of transporting uh, in the industrial zones, connecting the industrial zones, but also connecting the neighboring countries. It's very important, as we said, as the Prime Minister said, uh, as we know from our history, our experience, that uh, being a hub has a huge advantage because you can uh, use the synergy of having big uh, import volumes uh, and having the market behind not only the Belgian market but also the neighboring countries. So we will build the connections not only between the uh, uh, industrial areas in the first step but also very quickly to the neighboring countries. Uh, uh, the Netherlands, we are discussing already with France and we are already discussing with Germany. So that's quite important. Partnership will be key, of course, uh, to solve that. And so we are trying to partner up in the different parts of the value chain. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, let's move on to the, to the industry then. Uh, we often talk uh, about hydrogen as being the missing link, and it is. Um, but we also have uh, an enabling partner, and which are the industries. Uh, we talk a lot about the energy crisis today. There is also an, an, an climate crisis uh, going on and a climate crisis that we can also tackle uh, with hydrogen uh, for greening uh, the industries. And 
Um, we have worked in our strategy to work on different routes to bring uh, hydrogen under its different forms into Belgium, into Europe, Belgium as a gateway uh, to Europe. Uh, and uh, Pascal has explained uh, how the infrastructure can be built and that they are ready uh, to do it. Um, but then we have our industries, um, which are a crucial partner, uh, both uh, for, for, for energy uh, security, but also and foremost uh, for um, our climate uh, ambitions. Um, so what, is, um, what do you need as industries? Um, to make this happen. And in other words, a regulation, a regulatory framework always has to be an enabling regulatory framework. So it, can, it has to push you just a little step extra. But what do you need uh, specifically? And I want to uh, maybe first uh, go to, to Daria. She's the director of the Hydrogen uh, Council. She can speak for the sector as a whole. And then afterwards, we can to, um, go to uh, Wouter Blux, the business manager of Innoven, for uh, the more uh, specific um, investments uh, on, the, on the table. But Daria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Minister. And uh, we'd like to start by congratulating you, Minister, and of course, uh, Prime Minister De Croix on launching this, this milestone strategy today. I think that this is, a, this is a milestone moment for Belgium, for Central Western Europe, for Europe more, more widely. And I think that this strategy really represents an international best practice as it looks at hydrogen deployment at, from whole system perspective. So thinking global and acting regional and local. When it comes to acting regional and local, again, the strategy really has this holistic approach of looking at hydrogen integration, not only in one end use sector, but really across the board, starting with heavy industry, heavy transport and passenger vehicles, and moving to um, the use of hydrogen in providing the necessary flexibility to the power grid, necessary storage capacity, and of course, then, going forward, even exploring opportunities for using hydrogen in, in heating. So I think that that comprehensive vision and whole system approach to hydrogen deployment is really key to unlocking the cost efficiency gains that can be unlocked thanks to hydrogen. And of course, the other key element, the thinking global bit, is around capitalizing on the geostrategic role of Belgium. And as, as mentioned, um, it's quite symbolic that we meet here today at the port of Antwerp, the second largest chemical cluster in the world, Belgium being home to the most dense network of hydrogen grids globally. So indeed positioned uniquely to act as a best practice and as, as, a, as a hub, uh, connecting the routes, the North, uh, North Sea Corridor that is also invested in the Repower EU plan. So having this link and a hub for the North Sea Import Corridor uh, for hydrogen and derivatives and also exploring synergies with uh, CO2 infrastructure, also linking up and, and providing the vital link with the North African corridor, again, another trade route that is also envisaged in the Repower EU plan, and then, of course, the shipping route that you have mentioned already. So it's, it's truly a comprehensive, a very holistic vision for the development of the hydrogen economy, both in order to unlock the climate benefits, the socioeconomic benefits, deliver green growth and sustainable jobs here in Belgium and in Europe, and at the same time, create partnerships. Uh, there is already a strong partnership and um, um, engagement with, on hydrogen with such countries as Oman and Namibia, and there are more opportunities for cooperation in no with North Africa, and I'm sure that COP will provide a great opportunity to launch more strategic partnerships between Belgium, Central Western Europe, and the North African region. And I think that when we are when, when we're thinking about designing and crafting the regulatory framework for hydrogen in order to make sure, and, and its derivative in, in order to make sure that it's fit for purpose, we really need to make sure that qualifications for renewable hydrogen, for low carbon hydrogen, for derivatives are workable. There are such that would enable those imports that would not hinder and would not delay the import projects uh, into Europe and I think that really making sure that we do not delay the establishment of those workable qualifications is crucial. And of course, we cooperate on international and certification systems for hydrogen in order to enable the mutual recognition of those, making sure that we allow the certification systems to talk to each other, because that would be absolutely crucial to underpin closed border trade flows between Europe and countries um, in, the, in the wider region and the main prospective trade partners. And of course, also working closely on global standards, for example, a common standard methodology to assess 
the greenhouse gas footprint of all hydrogen production pathways. We feel that, you know, color code system is maybe a little bit, it perhaps is not the best way of um, um, indeed talking about hydrogen. When we talk about the carbon footprint, it's, when we're talking about different production pathways, it's really the carbon footprint that matters, right? So having one common way of assessing different pathways of producing and, and transporting hydrogen is absolutely critical. And that's why we're working, for example, with the International Organization for Standardization, and Belgium is already actively contributing to this work, to the development of a common global standard, and I think that's absolutely crucial. So um, when it comes to the unlocking those cross-border trade flows, definitely workable qualifications, cooperation on certification and standards, and um, when it comes to the vision for the industry within the country and within the region, there is already a great, um, a great impetus that is being put forward by the strategy, but definitely um, making sure that we open, open up the routes for hydrogen use across the end users, not, for example, in mobility, focusing not only on heavy duty, but also on passenger vehicles. Our latest study shows how having two infrastructures, both for BEVs and FCEVs, is actually cheaper than one, and it enables faster and cheaper decarbonization of the mobility sector. So, Really maximizing the cost efficiency gains of hydrogen, this is something that this strategy creates opportunities for. And um, again, congratulations to you on launching it. Yes, thank you. You mentioned Namibia, and it was also here at this specific place that we welcomed uh, the president uh, to Namibia to visit uh, the hydrogen uh, tugboat from uh, Alexander Savres. Also, the ambassador uh, to Namibia is here with us today. And only this weekend, we had a Amani delegation uh, here also in Antwerp, and uh, we worked a lot on, on certification. And we have the ambition, and I feel now obliged to say this because the Prime Minister said it's about implementation, also not only about uh, a strategy, that we um, were working on, on creating a pilot group, uh, Oman, uh, Belgium, uh, within the European Union to take this certification uh, forward. That is a perfect bridge uh, to you, Walter. Um, the Prime Minister said, and I totally agree with him, it's 10% strategy and then 90% implementing. And uh, we count on, on you, but of course, um, you will also count uh, on us. And so um, I think um, you can skip uh, the congratulations <laughs> and uh, maybe add a little spice to the debate, add a little spice to the debate. Um, now, making this work, what is further needed, further needed at one side to secure feedstock for our industries, access to this infrastructure uh, that we are building, and also working on our independence with regard to energy security. Thank you. Um, I think indeed the chemical industry can play an important role in the, in the hydrogen strategy, both from a supply side uh, and certainly also from a demand side. If you first, first look at the at the supply side, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, we need to make this work. And if we want to make this work, we have to work with uh, uh, flexible regulation. And first of all, if we then look to the, the, the RED2 uh, and the Delegated Act, you, this should not be restrictive. This should encouraging the production of hydrogen and not be too restrictive. I think it is clear that we all want to have green hydrogen uh, in the next uh, years to come. But if we really want to make it happen, we have to be sure that we have a transition period to be able to get there. And if uh, the legislation is too restrictive from the start, we will not be able to get there uh, in the first instance. So, red two, make, it, make the delegated act not too restrictive. That's point one. Second, if we have produced it, we need to get it to our sites, and then I think we need an open non-discriminatory uh, network to mm -hmm. transport the hydrogen uh, to our sites. Third, we need to stimulate demand. Um, because we talk a lot about supply, we say we want to have 10 million tons local production in Europe and 10 million tons of import, but we also need companies who are going to use it. Yeah? And that's where the chemical industry can indeed play an important role, but then it needs to be affordable. Yeah? So we need to stimulate uh, the demand by uh, not only uh, uh, CAPEX support, we also need to think about uh, certain OPEC support, contract mm -hmm. for difference. Germany is taking a great step there. Uh, they are looking at contract for difference, de-risking, helping to de-risk the projects so that the customers are clear what they will pay in the future for this, for this low carbon or green hydrogen in order to start the demand. And I think that is uh, extremely important. Um, 
Next to that, we are, we are not a big fan in the chemical industry of the colors of hydrogen. Uh, I cannot repeat it enough. I think what the U.S. has done with their Inflation Reduction Act, uh, they do not talk about colors at all. They just talk about the CO2 footprint of hydrogen. And at the end, that's what we want. We want to produce hydrogen with the lowest possible CO2 footprint, and let's focus on that. And now we are fighting a lot about colors of hydrogen, but I don't think it is necessary. We should look at the CO2 footprint. And that would also solve for the chemical industry uh, the issue with co-produced hydrogen. We have a lot of co-produced hydrogen. For instance, here in Belgium, it's, I think, 15% of our use. Uh, but we have no regulatory framework because it doesn't fit in the colors. If we go to the CO2 footprint of, uh, of the hydrogen, that would also be solved. And then last but not least, we will need import of hydrogen. That's clear. But I also would say let's also be ambitious in Belgium ourselves. Um, let's try at least also to create projects here. We have to learn. Uh, there is still a long way to go, and we have to learn it ourselves here also in Belgium. How do we produce it? How do we use it, etc.? And if we are just going to wait for import, this is not the right strategy. So we need to also have some local ambition here and develop it ourselves. I think that's in short what we think as a chemical industry. Local, local ambition is, uh, and local production is something that we absolutely look into, but I just want to give no false hope to anyone. We don't have the space in Belgium uh, to, and that's also reflected also in our first version of the hydrogen strategy for a uh, huge potential of, 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 of production here. Also with regard to the North Sea, the Princess Elizabeth zone, our second zone, will not be used to produce hydrogen, but we are working together um, with the Ashberg countries um, because other countries can do the combination and of course we are open to that. You wanted to add something to that. Yeah, I exactly wanted to add uh, that. Uh, so we should not be uh, look only at Belgium. We should here work Europe, uh, on a European level. Uh, Absolutely. Because there is a lot of wi wind and sun uh, available or certainly wind in certain countries mm -hmm. and we should work together between the European countries so that we do not only export or import from overseas, but that we also still have possibilities to produce that in Europe ourselves, and we have these possibilities. Yes, and for that we have this enhanced cooperation with Germany, with Denmark, also with the, with the Netherlands, uh, with, uh, with the Ashberg uh, countries. Maybe just um, a little follow-up and then we can uh, conclude. Is uh, the color book, I must admit, um, uh, we meet a lot as energy ministers, and the color book is not that much discussed anymore. Um, and it's because the crisis has taken precedence. Um, and we are now a lot talking about independence, about solidarity, how to make sure that we secure the energy and feedstock that we need. And in the forefront of our discussions, it's, it's not about the color book anymore. Um, so I was a little bit surprised that this uh, comes back. I feel that we as ministers, we have moved uh, forward on that topic. But let me be clear also, our strategy is about uh, green hydrogen, also because we have a project uh, with Belgian uh, industries um, being realized uh, today, like for example in Oman, uh, but also in other countries, Namibia, uh, also Chile, uh, with whom the Port of Antwerp has a uh, collaboration agreement, which are based also on uh, massive deployment of renewable energy. Uh, but we have moved on on this topic, and I heard you well, uh, we had an open and non-discriminatory uh, infrastructure. We couldn't agree more on that topic. And uh, last but not least, uh, unlocking demand um, is also um, of to our interest. Also, I think something that will come up in the next panel uh, with uh, Thomas Dermin is also about value chain and how we can make uh, industries and sectors uh, work uh, together. We have a lot of uh, work on the, on the table, but we have also moved uh, forward the last uh, year. So um, let's um, do a, a giant uh, leap uh, forward. And the, discuss the, de the decisions of today will secure our future in 10 years and 20 years' time. So I also count on you, and you can count on us too. Thank you. Thank you all. For the following panel on research and development and innovation, I would like to ask Thomas Dermine, State Secretary of Economic Recovery and Strategic Investment in charge of science policy on stage.
please also join us Ilham Kadri, CEO of Solve, Rafael Tilo, Executive President Renewables and Hydrogen at John Coqueril, Isabelle Francois, Project Manager at Watersoftnet. Unfortunately, Peter Gronja, Managing Director of Von Karman Institute, felt ill yesterday and will be replaced by Peter Simkins, Business Developing Manager of the Von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynam Dynamics. Welcome. Hello, good morning uh, to all. It's a pleasure to be here in Antwerp in this uh, magnificent building, thanks to the teams of the Port of Antwerp for welcoming us. I'm quite new into politics. Uh, I think Alexander, I even know that Sami Madi has left the government. I'm the youngest member of the government. And what strikes me into politics is that you have constantly to make the divide of your time between the daily flow of the political fights and the big stock you take for the future, the big decisions you take for the future. And what's complex is that in the end, you will be only remembered for the big decision you make that's going to have a big impact on the future. And Alexander, I fully agree that with this strategy on hydrogen and the collective initiative that we have taken, this is one of the big decisions that might be remembered 20, 30 years down the road. If we listen to the daily flow of comments in the media arena, we do realize two things. One is that making a transition to a low carbon economy is the number one priority. It's a short term priority because if you fight for a low carbon economy, you also fight for more energy sovereignty. The number two thing that you might notice is that if we talk about the transition to a low carbon economy, we talk a lot about modifying our behaviors, which of course cause a lot of social turmoil. And of course, modifying our behavior will be needed. We will need to think about how we travel, how we move, how we eat, how we eat our homes. But if we look through the history of mankind, what we notice is that A, we have done energetic transitions in the past, and B, that when we collectively were making this kind of transition, we were talking a lot about infrastructure and a lot about research and development. And that's also two significant orientations that this government has taken, is one, to invest massively in research and development. Belgium is ranked number two in Europe after Sweden in terms of R&D intensity in our economy, with 3.5% of GDP being dedicated to uh, research and development, and it's a joint effort of private and public initiative, and B, investing in infrastructure. The infrastructure investment grade in Belgium has been going down and down since the early 80s, and it's the first time in the last four decades that we are going up again with the objective that we will reach by the end of the term in 2024 to reach 3.5% of our GDP dedicated to uh, public investment. So, yes, indeed, um, success, as mentioned by Alexander and reminded by Tin, is 10% strategy, 90% implementation. Uh, Churchill has another, had another way to put it. He said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99 transpiration. It's the, basically the same. Um, and the good thing is that today we are presenting the strategy, but we have not waited for the strategy to work on the implementation, making sure that we were fully in line and what we were doing was fully coherent with the strategy. But we are already, if I look at the investment plan I'm coordinating in the federal government, we are already full steam ahead in implementation. Alexander mentioned that we are invested in our uh, investment plan at the federal level, uh, nearly 500 million in uh, hydrogen, and those projects are already in execution phase. It's the case on uh, research infrastructure, it's the case on transport uh, infrastructure, it's also the case on uh, several calls that we have uh, launched together with uh, Tim van der Straten on uh, industrial applications. And so today I have the chance to have a magnificent panel 
to discuss this joint partnership between public entities and, and, and private companies on how we can jointly work to, to push uh, the industrial value chain. First, I will um, have a question for Rafael Tido. Good morning, Rafael. Rafael is um, responsible for uh, green technologies at uh, John Cochrill, uh, a well-known company. Um, Rafael, you have, with John Cochrill, participated in a recent call for uh, clean industry on, on clean hydrogen, which was launched by the federal government. We have submitted two projects. Um, What's the point, actually, of having this kind of joint public-private uh, initiative on, on pushing private R&D in the industry? Thank you. Thank you for the, <clears throat> for the question. Indeed, um, at John Cockwheel, we are today <clears throat> number one in electrolyzer manufacturing today. The big challenge is to move from a niche industry, uh, where we stand today, to a mainstream global major industry. And, and this is going really fast. Uh. So indeed, uh, for us, uh, to get support in R&D is key, to go faster, um, because a lot has to be done in R&D. As you said, we have participated recently to two calls for projects uh, in Belgium. Uh, one is linked to um, uh, industrialization of the manufacturing of electrolyzer, and the other one is part of the Next H2Gen uh, initiative uh, with our partners in Belgium, with IMEC Vito, uh, Deme, Beckart, and Colroy to develop uh, a very innovative uh, and promising um, a new electroly electrolyzer technology. Um, it has been said earlier, this is also a competition uh, where Belgium is in competition in terms of technologies with other parts of the world, other parts of Europe. So the support from Belgium is, is very important. Here in Belgium, we have some champions. Uh, we have some champions, several are, are well known all around the world, so we are not starting from, from, from zero. Huh? And, and in order to keep this leadership position, the support from uh, the country is very, very important. Okay. Thank you, uh, Raphael. Maybe I, I will turn to uh, Isabelle Francois, who is project manager at uh, Waterstoff uh, Net. Um, how does this initiative launched at the, at the federal level um, how is it complementary with the various initiatives that we see that the regions in, in, in Belgium are launching, maybe uh, in Flanders or in, in, in Wallonia? How do you see this kind of complementarity in between what uh, we're doing at the federal together with the, with the region for the, the common good of the country? Okay, uh, I think funding is very important also to initiate collaboration. So we see with the regional funding that there is collaboration between Flemish companies, between uh, f balloon companies, if it's for the, Flemish, for the balloon uh, region. But if, if you want to initiate uh, co collaboration on Belgian level, then the federal uh, funding is very important. And uh, regarding complementarity, we also see that, the, 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 especially in Flanders, also the, the regional uh, funding is more on lower TRL and more on research, where why, why, uh, where the, the last call of the federal government is more on really industrial scale applications and that's, for that it's also very good to have that the federal uh, collaboration. But something I want to mention as well, it's, it's very good these, all these calls. Uh, we had the Energy Transition Fund which comes yearly and it stimulates collaboration but if you look at now the molecule call that, like it was mm -hmm. called uh, internally uh, that the last one and, and also <laughs> the, 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 the 50 million call uh, then, then you see that there is, I don't see in the strategy, I don't see any continuity on that. So I think these calls, they force, they, they, they stimulate collaboration, but people should also be able to prepare for the next call. So it would be very interesting to have a regular, uh, okay. regular continuity of these calls, so such that uh, collaborations can start to grow and that they can be, uh, uh, yeah, they have some results, the next call, so it's not, not not a plea for not to have uh, one call uh, in, in, a, in a governmental period, but have it one every year, like the ATF call already is. Okay, the thank case. you very much. And, and by the way, just complementing on that, in Belgium we are very good. We have a complex institutional system, everybody knows it, and we are very good at complaining when it doesn't, wo doesn't work. But on this very specific case, I must say, the collaboration in between the regions, the federal government, has been very good, because indeed it's, it's an issue, it's a strategy that needs to be uh, kind of fully coherent in between the regions because if you design a pipeline network it will naturally cross 
what we call the linguistic borders and we need to make the industry work together in every corner of the country and congratulations to, do, to all because it's the proof that things can still work in this country if we are uh, committed to the same objective. Before turning to um, Ilham Kadri and the question of, of local champions which is very much embodied by the aspiration of Solvay since day one, I would like just to ask a quick question to Peter Simpkins uh, on the Van Kerman Institute, a well-known research institute um, at the federal level, which is now taking a very bold move into, into hydrogen. Uh, Peter, can you tell us a bit more about this uh, hydrogen lab that you are currently designing? Um, thank you, Mr. State Secretary, and uh, thank you for having us here as a representative of the research community. Well, in, 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 and, and thank you also for uh, granting us this uh, initiative for the development of the hydrogen test uh, center. Well, we, we think that uh, for uh, scaling up the, uh, the, the hydrogen uh, uh, activities which exist uh, in, in, in our country, it, it is necessary to, to bridge the gap between the uh, academic research and industrial implementation, eh? and that's by scaling up. And uh, the, the missing gap that we saw is, is in, 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 in test facilities. On, on the other hand, we, we also see that uh, yeah, in, in investing in, in the infrastructure which is needed for the uh, test uh, facilities is, is yeah, in, in many cases not the core business of, of, the, of the companies. Huh? And, and therefore, uh, we, we have seen nice uh, successes in, in other sectors like the, the microelectronics where they have uh, uh, applied this uh, principle of uh, uh, shared investment and, and, and shared risk. And that's exactly the, the idea that we want to uh, uh, introduce also in this uh, hydrogen community by setting up this shared facility for the whole Belgian uh, hydrogen uh, economy. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Ilham Kadri, CEO of uh, Solve. we see that every revolution is an opportunity to create new champions using the home market um, to basically establish your credentials. And actually, if you look back at the history of the group that you're leading today, Solvay, it's a group that dated actually from the first industrial revolution, but that has been able to reinvent itself across the cycles of technological change. Do you believe today that the disruption we're going to know in the next few years in terms of uh, energy supply is actually an opportunity to create new champions in Belgium and in Europe? Absolutely, and our group, as you said, starts 160 years ago, probably in Charleroi. You are from Charleroi, right? You have Definitely. good intel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we did our homework, yeah. So we started 160 years ago, uh, inventing soda ash, reinventing the glazing around you today, and indeed our group has changed a lot. So coming to our um, story today, and we are proud to be Belgium. Every multinational has nationality. It happens that ours is Belgium. Very proud of it. Um, during these critical times with unbearable and unacceptable war where we are facing an energy crisis which is affecting our industries and the chemical industry, I've always said the chemical industry has been part of the problem, emissions, but we are part of the solution. Um, and at Solvay, we, we, um, we have now a carbon neutrality target by 2050. Uh, we need 2 billion euro investment to get it there. But we are also enablers of all these uh, decarbonization. So we launched a few platforms. One is the batteries, which now we have a hub in, in France, uh, where we will be building the largest membrane enabling the EV and the, the, the hybrid uh, business uh, in Europe. And this is the onshoring of batteries. Um, on, ga on, on gas and hydrogen, we believe there will be no, no net zero zero without green hydrogen. So regardless, Innovin said it, regardless of the soup of colors, we believe we need low carbon hydrogen. So we are an enabler uh, through membranes. So we are inside your electrolyzers. We are invisible, but without us, it doesn't work. So we are in electrolyzers. Um, and today there are different technologies in electrolyzers. And why innovation is important is to get the, the cost down. We need hydrogen at scale and we need it at low cost. Today is four times more expensive than what it should be, around eight euro a kilo. We need two euro a kilo to make it scalable, right? So indeed, a lot of has been said during the former panel that there is an infrastructure. There are areas like in Nordiska, which have been blessed with hydropower and wind, solar coming from the south. So wherever Belgium now uh, gets 
it's hydrogen, be it from north, south, or shipping. We need an infrastructure here. And I hope that there is a bigger ambition than just transporting back this hydrogen to our neighbors in Germany. And I know there is lack of space, but I hope that there will be hope for innovation for ourselves, including at Solvay. So for me, there are three critical things. It's time for the industry to reinvent itself. Uh, it's uh, a sign for hope, actually. I'm an optimist, I'm a humanist, I'm a scientist, so I believe that science uh, will bring those technologies and hydrogen is part of it, like batteries. It's just eight or ten years uh, behind the batteries. Uh, half of the cost of the, uh, an EV car just a few years back was a battery, and now it's 20%, and we're going to get it to a single digit. It's the same for hydrogen. Um, and the beauty is that we all believe that from water will be fuel is not me, Jules Verne said it in 1870s, and that's what we are do doing with hydrogen. The chemists we are, we can do it. We need it at scale. We need policies. We need a framework. Uh, we need permitting. It's just too long. And we need the united single market in the EU. And like what we see today between Germany and the rest of the world, we need the single market to really get their acts around and help the industry to just unleash our potential. Thank you. Uh, very much. Just a, a follow-up question. Our Prime Minister mentioned before that 20 years ago, industrial policy was in Europe nearly a dirty word that we were not mentioning um, anymore. Today it's going back uh, with, in the background, uh, a revival of some, I would say, geostrategic tensions. Um, if you were to be a commissioner for industrial policy in Europe, what would be the top one or two policy that you would implement beyond the question that you mentioned on the, on the single market and, and the permitting issue? I am not. <laughs> I'm not a commissioner, but... Ne never uh, I say think, never. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've never got such insight. Um, no, uh, joke aside, I think what is important for us as industries is that uh, we, ha policy, we need policies which help us to unleash our, our potential. Uh, we are agnostic at Solve to, you know, energy types. We just want to have green energy, right, to decarbonize our, uh, our industry. Uh, the EU has told us, look, you are going to go through transitions. It's bold, the green transition, the digital transition. I would also refer to the just transition, not leaving anybody behind. So we have multiple transitions to go through. What we need from the authorities is to build a level playing field where innovation can be unleashed, right, without, without limit. And the level playing field is important between the EU member states. Again, I'm talking about Germany and the rest of uh, member states, giving some messages here before I leave. But the second part is the level playing field with the rest of the world. We have a carbon price in, in Europe. When I moved from the US to Europe in 2019, the carbon pricing was 25 euro a ton. We put it at 50 in my company. Now it's 100, and we are already there, right? So we were proactive in saying, um, projects where we're going to invest in, if they don't go through the 100 euro per ton, you know, stress test is not a good project for Solvay. But in the U.S. there is no federal carbon pricing. In China it's uh, embryonic and emerging. So that level playing field for industries, for us putting money to green, decarbonize our energy uh, for the right thing, for building a very strong and green industry for our, our kids and future leaders is the right thing to do. But climate, ha climate has no frontier, right? It doesn't stop at the, at the EU border. So we need Europe to lead the way, and that's what we are doing boldly with ambition, but also to you know, come and federate with the, the, the Biden administration and hopefully the Xi administration uh, to get quicker than 2060 or 2050 decarbonization. Thank you very much. One last very quick word from um, Isabel. You are uh, working for Waterstoff uh, Net, which groups uh, companies in the, with the industrial application on hydrogen with an equivalent in, in the southern part with the Tweet cluster. Tomorrow you'll be working in a reinforced um, H2 uh, council in Belgium. You have a lot of uh, members uh, here in the room. What actually can they do uh, to, to, to work together with you and, and push this, this topic on hydrogen very pragmatically in the next few days? Well, the, the intention of the Hydrogen Council is in fact twofold. First, we want to have a 
and uh, we want to promote the Belgian industry towards the outside world. So we have now a Flemish ecosystem and Walloon ecosystem, but together we are stronger also in the neighboring countries. We have a German hydrogen council, we have France Hydrogen, we have the National Waterstof Programme in the Netherlands. So they are all grouping on national level and we don't have an equivalent at this moment. So it's important to have that, to reinforce our, con uh, our companies and to ex export, to promote uh, our companies and, and export their technology to other countries. And the second the second goal of the, of the Hydrogen Council is to have the internal dialogue and to advise our different governments. They have own strategies, Flanders has a strategy, the federal strategy, the Walloon strategy, and in fact we have to, call, we have to implement these strategies in, in an efficient way. And if we want, there are cross-border uh, competencies, so if we want to implement it in, a, in an efficient way, we need to have discussions on a national level with the different regions, with the industry, and with the, with the, with the governmental uh, representatives okay. together. Thank you very much, Isabel, and thanks to the four of you for these uh, insights on the industry. Thank you very much. to all panelists for these insights and a fruitful discussion. We have already reached the end of our interesting morning, but we have yet one more speaker. I would like to give the floor now to a representative of the European Commission, Director General Energy, Deputy Director General Ms. Mechtelt Wurzdurfer. Dear Prime Minister de Mr. De Groot, dear Minister Tine van Staten, dear Jacques van der Meeren, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my commissioner is right now in the college in Strasbourg uh, adopting our new temporary crisis package, uh, which we have been discussing uh, already quite a bit and which will be the topic of the European Council on Thursday and Friday and then in the Energy Council next week. So I'm very pleased to be here and I excuse the Commissioner uh, for, for this very reason. So we are very happy with the hydrogen strategy which was presented today and it's very much in line, I can say already, with what we have proposed in our own hydrogen strategy but also in Repower EU. And let me maybe underline a few words uh, on the crisis which we are facing right now. We are doing our utmost uh, with temporary measures in looking at how to really tackle the issue of energy prices but also security of supply in line with the longer term climate aspects, our European Green Deal and the Fit for 55. So both are really in line and I think when we speak about Repower EU, it has really three objectives. One is energy efficiency first, everything we can do on the energy saving and the demand reduction. Secondly, it's about diversification. We heard it, we are, had been dependent on Russian gas imports for more than 40% in the beginning of the year. Right now, we have it reduced to around 7.5%. It's diversification, it's new suppliers uh, in the short term, but also then in longer terms, we will go for hydrogen partnerships in order to really uh, uh, diversify. And third objective of free power is definitely the clean energy transition. So it's the acceleration of permitting, of renewables, of clean hydrogen, and all other technologies, heat pumps, and everything we can do to accelerate. So what we have in our free power EU is definitely ambitious targets also for hydrogen, clean, uh, renewable hydrogen. We want to produce 10 million tons by 2030 of domestic production, and 10 million tons of hydrogen imports. And these import targets are equivalent to around 330 terawatt hour in 2030, so around 16 times more than the new Belgian targets for hydrogen imports of 20 terawatt hours. In other words, our ambitions to increase the import of hydrogen and hydrogen deriv derivatives are crucial for meeting our Europe's ambition, and Belgium plays a huge part of it. We are also increasing the attractiveness of Europe for the global hydrogen market. There are other players. There's Japan, Australia, Chile, and others. 
on that global market. That's why we are engaging in the Clean Energy Ministerial. There is a global hydrogen ports coalition. The Port of Antwerp is part of it. And I think it shows really the hub ports can bring together with a lot of industry, energy intensive industries, but also uh, producers of hydrogen and uh, how we can use that all together industry uh, at that part. We are also part of the International Partnership on Hydrogen Economy and we will develop more and more green hydrogen partnerships at a bilateral level which will be presented at COP27, so in two, three weeks, where we will announce the first number of green hydrogen partnerships in, to support flows of hydrogen into Europe. And that will not arrive tomorrow. We need to be ambitious and prepared. But I think today's venue here in the nice harbor of Antwerp is symbolic for our joint ambitions. So where's the uptake of this hydrogen? We know the green hydrogen market is very nascent. We are not yet there. We need really demand and supply to come together. In our scenario, renewable hydrogen can substitute 27 BCM of imported Russian national gas, 4.7 BCM of imported Russian oil and cooking coal imports. We can, with renewable hydrogen, replace natural gas consumption, both in refineries, ammonia production and chemicals, as we heard, as well in replacing cooking coal in the steel sector. The cooperation with industry is here absolutely crucial. We also expect higher consumption of hydrogen in hard to abate transport sectors. Here we see it mainly in heavy duty trucks and waterborne sectors, such as the production of sustainable fuels for aviation. We have a legal framework, our renewables directive, which is right now in uh, negotiations between European Parliament and Council, is also giving a high emphasis not only to accelerate permitting, and we are counting on Belgium's support here as well, but also on targets for renewable fuels of non-biological origin for industry and for transport, and we are really grateful for Belgium's support for these increased ambitions which we are negotiating right now. As it was said, we also need production within the EU and through imports. And very similar, which is in the strategy which was presented today, we also see that hydrogen can arrive through ships that we need, and that means we need to enable the infrastructure in our ports to accommodate these new energy flows, as well as support for cross-border infrastructure within Europe. And that is also key that we are working on. We see three hydrogen import pipeline corridors from the north, from the Mediterranean, and from Ukraine once the war is over. And that is very much in line what we hear, what, what we heard today from you when we hear about Belgium being connected to pipelines from North Seas or Southern countries in the future, but also ships, which is very competitive right now. We are having a framework in our trans-European network for energy, where we include dedicated hydrogen, and there is some funding under our uh, um, clean energy facility, uh, CEF, where we can use money for dedicated hydrogen infrastructure in the future, but we also have the hydrogen and gas market decarbonization package, which is also under negotiation. And here, I know that Belgium is supportive, but they want us, that's mentioned in the study, to go even faster. So we try our utmost, but we also need the partners from Parliament and Council. Money plays a role, and that's why we have mobilized different European funding scheme. I already mentioned the Connecting Europe facility. They are the cohesion funds, and as the Prime Minister mentioned, the recovery and resilient funds are there to help to develop this uptake of infrastructure. We also need to support the early market creation with the European objective. And our President von der Leyen has mentioned in her State of the Union speech very recently what we call that we need to establish a hydrogen bank. It's not a physical bank. It's not EIB in Luxembourg. It's a facility. It's a fund which we want to set up. 
and it's in our work program for next year. So we are already working right now that this bank or facility is the creation of an early market for renewable hydrogen and also to scale up early investments across the value chain. So it's really with a focus on the production of European hydrogen in the EU and some examples for imports. And here we are currently exploring the possibility to develop auctions for both the production and offtake of renewable hydrogen under the Innovation Fund. And here I think the Hydrogen Council, the Belgian Hydrogen Council, can play a role in giving us input what needs to be done in that uptake and what can this facility offer to create that market of supply and demand. So we have a roadmap, or we are preparing a roadmap for the Hydrogen Bank, and it's in our work program next year. We are already working also with others, like the H2 Global, which is something Germany has set up and Netherlands has joined. It might be not the same, it might be a similar uh, uh, tool, but all ideas are right now wel welcome on what we can do in that context. So finally, as it was also mentioned uh, in the speeches, but also in the study, the cooperation, bilateral cooperation with the neighbors of Belgium, but also at EU level, and I was very pleased to hear that this was underlined absolutely. So there is a uh, really important need for collaboration across the value chain within Belgium, but also with the partners and at EU level. We have put a lot of emphasis, for example, on North Sea collaboration. We are very happy with how the, how, uh, the North uh, Energy Corporation platform, the NECP, is working well. The iceberg declaration was uh, a high-level event. Our president was there together with Belgium, uh, Germany, Denmark, and others. It shows the significance of offshore wind in that area as well, and we are ho very happy to facilitate that cooperation, including establishing rules for cost-benefit and analysis when it comes to joint infrastructure in that context. We think there are excellent new opportunities to produce hydrogen here in that region and meet the industrial demands in and around the ports. I already highlighted, and it's also in the report, the th synergy with imports via ships as the infrastructure in the hinterland could be used for multiple purposes. So we are very pleased and we are happy that this European cooperation is a crucial part. We were very happy to see that several Belgian projects have been approved under the process of important projects of common European interest. I saw five and most of the companies are present here. So this is really a success. We are very happy. I knew it took some time of discussions to have it approved. Now they are approved and we are looking together with DG Competition on how eventually prolong these IPC buys. We are also happy to see that one example is the scaling up of electrolyzer production facility within Belgium, which is important in the European market. So in conclusion, we very much welcome today's event and the Belgium Hydrogen Strategy. We are very happy and interested to work together on the implementation. We heard implementation is crucial. There are already some projects. There is uh, an avenue for green hydrogen in the future. It's getting more competitive, also with the high gas prices right now, but there is a transition that we all need and look at low carbon hydrogen projects for our industry and for our uptake of what we are achieving together. So we have the right framework in place. There's some money, but we need to implement it together. Thank you very much for inviting us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Verzerfer, for your insights. We'll now close the event with some group photos, but first um, some practical notice. I would, ask, would like to ask the press to already install themselves in the designated area. We will do three signs uh, of pictures. The first will be the Belgium government with all the sea levels on stage at the atrium. Then we'll do, do a picture with the members of the Belgian government and the ambassadors present. And the last picture will be of all the speakers today on this event. 
to all other those, all those who have followed the event online. We hope you enjoyed this event and please feel free to stick around for our networking reception at the atrium. Thank you and don't forget to scan the Federal Hydrogen Strategy. The QR code.